Okay, we're on? We're on, fantastic. Yeah, so uh, yesterday morning I woke up in Sydney, Australia, and now I'm here, so thank you very much for your invitation. If any of you would like to know what tomorrow is like, just ask, because I am already there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how time works. Okay, so uh, our topic tonight is called The Fine-Tuning of the Universe for Life. It's uh, very much a rising topic in academia and outside of academia. So what I'd like to do is to give you a sense of, of what this topic is all about, and it's really about how the universe could have been different. So to tell you how that is, it would be very handy if we all knew how the universe was. Now, this one. So it'd be quite handy if... Um, sorry, don't... Where's the water? Um, it'd be quite handy if we could start off just by me teaching you all of astrophysics. That would be a really handy way to start. So I will. Now, uh, I've done this before, and I've done it with 10th graders, and they all got it, so you're going to be fine. Uh, I love seeing the whites in people's eyes who got invited tonight, but didn't quite know what this was about. And uh, what, what did he do for a living? He's an astrophysicist? Oh, come on. But we can do this. It's going to be fine. Okay? So let's get started with a gratuitous astronomical picture of a galaxy. I need one concept from you tonight. This is all we need for the physics here. That, that concept is called equilibrium, right? You, we want to know how the universe makes things out of its basic stuff, right? Those are technical terms. So just think about this hill here, and when I point that at the screen, it totally disappears. Never mind. Um, there are... Perfect, thank you. Um, there are two places you could put a ball on this hill where it will not move, right? Obviously, there's that one, and there's that one down the bottom. Now, there is another difference between those two, in that if I, the one at the top, if I nudge it, it'll go away from that equilibrium point, whereas the one at the bottom, if I kick it, will come back towards the equilibrium point. That's called a stable equilibrium. So all we want to know is the stuff in the universe. There's all sorts of forces pulling it and pushing it in all sorts of directions. How can I set it up so that it will be in a stable equilibrium? That's the only concept we need tonight. So all what we need to know next is how are the ways that the universe pushes stuff around? So there are four fundamental forces, and I want to sort of add two extra ones for reasons I'll add a bit later. So here's the most technical bit of the talk, okay? There are four fundamental ways in which the universe pushes stuff around. The first one is gravity, which we're all familiar with because we're all stuck to the floor. No one is floating in midair. Uh, that's not a trick that we're going to do here tonight. Uh, the second one is electromagnetism, which we're all also quite familiar with, the ordinary hardness of things. This floor is holding me up because of the electromagnetic forces there. Um, the, it, it's, uh, it's also the force that pushes uh, uh, electrons along wires for electricity. Uh, you're all familiar with magnets. That's number two. Those are the familiar ones. The two you might not have heard of are called the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. If you remember from high school a picture of atoms, that nucleus at the center of the atom, uh, the strong force is what's holding that together, and the weak force is something that might cause some of them to fall apart. It's a cause of radioactivity. That's probably the last time I'm going to mention the weak force in this talk, because it's not particularly relevant, but for completeness, it's up there. The other two things I need to tell you about, uh, we'll start with what's called thermal pressure, which is this. So the gas in this room is bouncing around, and in particular it bounces off the walls and exerts a pressure on things. That's when you talk about air pressure, that's what's going on. Uh, when you take a balloon and you try to squash it, it will fight back against you because you're putting all of those particles in less space. So they hit the sides more often. That's why a balloon will fight against being constricted. Okay? And when you put a hole in a balloon, everything rushes out. The, other thing, the only other thing I need to tell you is the one there labeled the Pauli exclusion principle. Basically, the very basic stuff of our universe obeys different sets of laws to the ones we're used to. They're called quantum laws. And all I need you to know is, if thermal pressure means stuff doesn't like getting squished, the Pauli exclusion principle says quantum stuff really, really doesn't like being squished. And that's all I need you to know, okay? There won't be an exam. There definitely won't be any equations. So those are the basic stuff. How can we put them together, play them off against each other to make things that are stable? So, for example, I can play electromagnetism off against the Pauli exclusion principle, and hey presto, I've made atoms. So thanks to electromagnetism, the negatively charged particles will be attracted to the strong, the um, positively charged particles, hey presto, that thing's going to hold itself together, 
but it won't totally collapse because these are quantum things and they don't like being totally squished. There is atomic physics in one sentence. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that'll do for today. Okay? The particularly nice thing about this is it, it keeps them in these orbits around, so actually they're three dimensional. So when you put two atoms close to each other, they can go on complicated orbits around more than one thing, and that's chemistry in one sentence. So we're really moving tonight, aren't we? This is fantastic. Wonderful. That's how you bind stuff together. Now, the universe is pretty good at this. That's DNA. So uh, there are the elements. The different elements are just how many positive charges there are at the center uh, of each atom. And if you <laughs> put them together in the right order, you can make the instructions for a person. That's really quite impressive. Um, so that's an example. All right. So now's the part where we have the question which basically answers all of astrophysics. All right, here we go. What's fighting gravity? All we're going to do is play these other forces off against gravity. Gravity is always attractive. It's always pushing in, right? We're always stuck to the floor. You can't just levitate it. Will, something has to fight gravity. So if there's something out there in the universe which is not completely crushed by gravity, something is fighting gravity, one of those other forces. And as you play the other forces off against gravity, you get the different type of stuff in the universe. So if you've read a book on astronomy, you might know all the sort of menagerie of things out there, quasars and pulsars, uh, stars and planets and asteroids and all of that. We can put them into one coherent scheme with this question. So here we go. If the thing that's fighting gravity is nothing, you get a black hole, obviously. That's the thing where gravity is totally one. Now, why do we think that there are black holes? This is awesome. Okay. We are in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. Hopefully you all knew that by now. Um, we can sort of see where the center of that galaxy is. We're sort of around the outskirts. We can point our, our, our telescopes toward the center. There is a particularly bright source of radio waves, but we don't see anything there with an optical telescope, a telescope that works like your eyes. We can, however, look very closely at the very center of our galaxy where that star is, and watch it. So this is 1995, that's a year. We're going to watch it for a, a decade or so, or two. Um, and we can watch these. These are all stars. They're not actually that big, that's just the blurriness of the telescope. But we can watch these things as they go close to the thing at the center of the galaxy. And this is what happens. Nope, that's not what happens. There we go. That and that is a billion, billion, billion ton nuclear fusion star, nuclear fusing star, making a complete U-turn in about a month. What is there? There's an awful lot of stuff there in a very small region. So this is why we think that there is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. I would love to talk about this all night, but unfortunately I'm going to make myself carry on. I will, however, let you watch it again because it's pretty cool. Um, so. There's something there which weighs about as much as a million suns. And anything that goes close to it does a complete U-turn pretty quickly, no matter how, you know, any star size thing. So we're pretty sure there's something there that's probably a black hole. There's nothing that could sort of hold it up, itself up against that. Yeah. Must move on. Okay. Gravity versus atoms. Remember, we're just going to play the other forces off against gravity. If the thing that's holding whatever it is up against gravity is just the ordinary uh, hardness of matter that we're familiar with, we've got ourselves a planet. That's what a planet is. In particular, a planet is something which is held up by atomic forces, but so big that, that gravity has molded it into a sphere, so it's holding itself up as hard as it can. Any, any sort of big enough mountain gets pulled into the spherical shape. So here is Earth, and here are our neighbors in the solar system, and uh, points if you can name them all later. All right, we're moving on. Um, if we say well, there's a point at which that ordinary hardness of matter isn't enough, we need something else to hold ourselves up against gravity, and if that uber quantum things don't like being squished, things kicked in, then what we have, for a, what we have is a, what's called a brown dwarf. Okay? Sorry, I'm going to try and keep an eye on the time. Um, so if, if ordinary hardness of matter won't help, there's, a, there's something that else that kicks in. It's called a brown dwarf. There's an artist's impression. They don't do very much, so there's nothing much more than an artist's impression, but they should at least be out there in the universe. If you're slightly bigger than Jupiter, then uh, uh, ordinary atomic forces aren't going to work for you. The next step up we're quite familiar with, if you play off gravity 
against ordinary gas pressure, the balloon fighting you kind of gas pressure, what you have then is a star. That's how stars work. We balance those forces and uh, what we get is something that shines very hot. It's called thermal pressure, so obviously this thing's going to have to be pretty hot to hold itself up against gravity. Um, as, uh, because it's hot, it will glow. So light will, will, will transfer energy through the body of the star, and when it gets to the edge, instead of bouncing back into the star, some of it will leak out. This leaking energy uh, is what we ordinarily call sunlight, but if, being an astronomer, we think of it as leaking energy. Um, to make up for that, we need something to be an internal power source for the star, and that's where these uh, strong forces come in. Nuclear reactions will replace the energy that's leaked, and so you have a star which can be stable for an awfully long period of time. Here's a selection of stars that the universe prepared earlier. Let's start at the start. If you can follow this all the way in your imagination, you're doing a lot better than I am. There are the four smallest planets. There's Earth. Ready? Shrink that one down. There's the rest of the planets. There's Jupiter. Shrink that one down. There's the Sun. And now we have the bigger one. Shrink that one down. Whoop. And there's some even larger stars. Shrink that one down. And then we get some even larger stars. And then we get the largest stars of them all, which have about 300 times the mass of our Sun. Now, that looks like a wide range of things, but when you're an astrophysicist, actually, that's a narrow range of things. For some reason, well, actually for reasons we, we understand in terms of the fundamental forces, um, stars prefer to have a certain number of particles, not, not less and not more. If you're too small, then you won't fire up because that quantum squishiness or anti-squishiness will take over. And if you're too big, much bigger than that one, you'll be unstable. And so stars are in this range. It's between uh, the number of particles in a star, the number of digits in there, is between 55 and about 58, which is actually kind of an interesting number, right? 59 won't work, 54 won't work, but in that range, hey presto, stars. Um, one of the great things about stars is that when they change their fuel source, this happens. So this, the sun at the moment is burning hydrogen into helium, when that's all gone, gone, it will need to sort of reorient itself, reorientate itself, heat up a bit to, to burn helium into heavier elements still. Th this is what the universe does when it does a fuel change. Just, or it does this. Or no, I could do this all night. These are called planetary nebulae. They've got actually nothing to do with planets. It's a historical name. Uh, we had a talk at the University of Sydney from a guy who studies planetary nebulae, and one of the, the great things about them, <laughs> which he put up on his slide, what are they useful for? The bottom one was propaganda. If you've built a telescope, point at one of these, because you'll get a great picture of the, them. Okay? Um, actually, that screen's pretty good, but you do owe yourself to go on the, the Hubble telescope website, get a great quality computer screen, a dark room, some Beethoven, some scotch, and really look through these these uh, pictures in a lot of detail. I should say, when astronomers get together and do like career seminars, no one ever has to get up and sort of, of, you know, why would you want to be an astronomer? No one ever gives that talk. Obviously you want to be an astronomer. This is what the universe looks like, right? Um, what we spend most of our time talking about is how on earth do I get paid for this? <laughs> and, and if anyone has any ideas, please talk to me afterwards. Uh, good. What's next? Okay, we, want, we can fight gravity also with motion, organized motion. So you are hopefully familiar with the fact that the Earth goes around the Sun. We don't get pulled into the Sun because we're moving at about 29 kilometers per second. Doesn't feel like it, does it? But you are. Uh, that's an organized form of motion. We can also do it in a disorganized way in what's called a globular cluster. If you put enough stars together, they'll hold themselves together with everything sort of buzzing around. So, this is what a globular cluster looks like. There's a wonderful quote. It's from Richard Feynman underneath. But uh, if one cannot see gravitation acting here, he has no soul. Uh, so here's what we think is happening. Um, if you can see that, the stars all buzz around each other. They're held together by their sort of mutual attraction, but they're all moving fast enough that they don't just hit the center and stop. They carry through to the other side and keep, and keep buzzing around. Now you might wonder, do they hit 
one another as they're doing all of this? And the answer to that is no. Stars are ridiculously small in, in, on astronomical scales. So even in the densest bit of a globular cluster, the amount of space taken up by a single star is, is in, compared to the space around it is comparable to a, a grain of sand in a football stadium. It's, it's nothing. So unfortunately, we're not going to see stars hit each other, which would, would be cool, but never mind. We can get on with that. That same difference between orderly ro rotation to hold yourself up against gravity and this chaotic um, a random motion to hold us up, up against gravity is played out again on a larger scale with galaxies. So there is the pinwheel galaxy looking very uh, resplendent there. What we can see if we look at this sort of galaxy side on is that it is rotating in an orderly fashion. So we can't look at that one side on. It's a bit hard to just wander around the side of a galaxy. But we can see other galaxies that are side on. And we can measure the speeds in each side. That one side's going away, one side's going towards, so it's going around. Right? You can also see that random motion in what's called an elliptical galaxy, which you've probably never seen an example of before, because no one's going to put that on an astronomical uh, calendar. Okay? Uh, they're just not quite as pretty. You'll notice another difference. The last one was called the Needle Galaxy, and the one before that, the Pinwheel Galaxy. This one is called NGC 1132. No one bothered giving that a pretty name. Who cares? We're just moving on. OK. Um, finally, you might think, what's holding up the universe as a whole? And the answer is the universe as a whole is not in an equilibrium state. It's not one of these. It's expanding. Everywhere we look in the night sky, the galaxies are moving away from us and moving in the sort of way that, that suggests that everything is moving away from everything else. So if we look at, think about the surface of a balloon as it blows up, everything is moving away from everything else in a very predictable way. If you're twice as far away, you're moving twice as fast, which is what this thing will happen in this uh, particular arrangement. So, first part of the talk, done. If uh, I see young people here, if you're thinking of doing a degree in astrophysics, don't bother, I've just done it for you. Right, we're, we're sorted, okay? This is the Rosetta Stone, the cheat sheet of the universe. What's fighting gravity? Black holes, uh, where nothing's fighting gravity. If it's atoms, then there's uh, asteroids and planets. If it's uh, this quantum squishiness, then it's brown dwarfs. For stars, it's thermal pressure with some nuclear reactions to stop the whole thing from burning down. Planetary systems and disk galaxies, it's rotation. Globular clusters and elliptical galaxies, random motion. And the universe is expanding. Ta-da! All right. Here's what we're going to do with that bit of information. When we do all of this, and you can do this in hand wavy like I just did it, or you can do it all, all in terms of equations. When we get those equations, you have something like the mass of a star, typically. You balance everything up. On the other side of the equation, how do we actually do that calculation? So there are pure numbers in there, of course, things like 2 and pi. But there are also what are called the fundamental constants of nature. There are these numbers that appear in our equations, as we know them, which the equations themselves do not explain. Things like, how heavy is an electron? We can go and measure it, but no one's been able to calculate that from any sort of deeper theory. So these kinds of numbers, the masses of the fundamental particles, how strong are each of these forces that I've been talking about, and the, the cosmos as a whole, uh, how fast does it expand, things like that, are numbers that are in our equations, we can measure them, but we don't know why they are what they are. And they present a particularly deep mystery because they just, it's just a number. We just go and measure it, and then there it is. And we would like to know why they have the particular value they do. But after an awful lot of time, we haven't got any better ideas on that. So here's Feynman, again, Richard Feynman, a famous physicist from the last century, saying, um, talking about the strength of electromagnetism as one of these numbers, he says, all good theoretical physicists put this number up on their wall and worry about it. Immediately, you would like to know where this number comes from. Nobody knows. It's one of the greatest mysteries of physics, a magic number that comes to us with no understanding. So what we can do is, is ask a slightly related question, which is, what if those numbers were different? That seems like a personally, perfectly innocent question to ask, but that's what takes us down the road to fine-tuning. Because we, we can understand what's going on in a star, what's going on in our universe, what the forces are that balance these things, because we have the equations, we can say what would happen if those numbers were different. And one of the really interesting things we can ask is, do we still get those equilibria? Can I still make stuff? Will I just get a bigger type of star, or will I lose that equilibrium altogether? 
I don't want to give away the ending. It turns out it's quite easy to completely ruin the universe. Let me take you through a couple of examples. So you remember the atom? There it is. Um, apologies if I'm giving anyone flashbacks to high school physics or something. We'll get through it. It'll be fine. So three of the numbers that we can't explain are the, uh, are the masses of the basic stuff that make you up. There's, an there's the electron, and actually the proton and the neutron aren't fundamental. They themselves are made of smaller things called quarks. All right? You'll either remember that piece of information tomorrow or you won't. That's fine. What we'd like to do is take a closer look at what would happen if those numbers were different. So what we're going to do is represent those three numbers sort of graphically on a plot. So let this block represent the possibilities for those three numbers. So to specify somewhere in a three-dimensional space, you need three numbers. So how far am I from this corner and that corner and that corner gives me where I am. So the top of the block here is going to represent what's called the Planck mass, which is basically the point at which our, beyond which our theories don't know what happens because we don't know how to put together quantum mechanics and gravity. You can talk, ask me about that later. I don't know either, but I can just tell you more about that problem. Um, at the bottom, we have a, there's a sort of natural cutoff cut at the bottom, which I'll not bore you with either. Um, we're going to do this on a, what's called a logarithmic scale, which is instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we go in powers of 10, so we can squish more stuff in. 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Okay? So that's how we're going to fit in 60 orders of magnitude, 60 powers of 10 into that one block. So here are your menu options. You pick a point in that block, and you've picked the masses of those three things that make up everything you see around us. And um, so if you want to go home and make your own universe, uh, you can pick somewhere in this block. I'm going to help you out by carving off bits of the block which won't make an interesting universe. Okay? Here's how this is going to work. We want to stay clear of those two areas for a start. Okay? Here's what goes wrong in those two areas. Over here, there is something that's a bit like a proton. It's not exactly a proton. The problem is it won't stick to anything else at all. And so chemistry consists of one element which undergoes one chemical reaction. So if you're familiar with the chemistry of hydrogen, let me summarize it for you. Hydrogen plus hydrogen makes a hydrogen molecule. End of lesson. So that's all that happens in this universe. That's chemistry, done, right? No one there to learn that, but that's chemistry in that universe. Over here, even more interesting, that has the chemistry of helium, which is to say no chemistry at all. There is one chemical element in the universe and no chemical compounds, no chemical reactions. Okay? Just, to, just to contrast that, in our universe there's a database online, which you can go and look up if you're a masochist, which lists all the chemical elements, sorry to any chemists present, uh, which lists all the chemical elements, uh, uh, sorry, all the chemical compounds we've discovered so far. So there are 92 natural elements, you may remember, hydrogen, helium, uh, other ones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lithium, that's the third one, that's as high as I'm going. Um, uh, all, so there are 50 million on that database, right? So 50 million known chemical compounds in our universe, okay? Here, none. So I'd steer clear of those, because nothing's going to happen in those universes. It's interesting. The most that happens when two particles approach each other, rather than, hey, presto, we've made DNA, is they bounce off each other and leave. Um, oh, I made this thing spin around. Yeah. And then thought, that wasn't impressive as I wanted, so I didn't bother. Okay, there's a couple more areas we want to avoid. Um, in, uh, we want to make sure that your nucleus doesn't eat the electron around it. That's something you don't want to happen, because there goes chemistry again. You would like the proton and the neutron to be stable and to be able to stick to each other, so again, we can make things bigger than hydrogen. And uh, so if you want to avoid those two particular fates, you better avoid all the white area around here, stick in that narrow slice. Uh, we can bring, these are making the elements that are fuel for stars, so we can bring stars in. You would like your stars to be stable, and you would like them to be able to fire up uh, without get, becoming so big that they're completely unstable. Um, so you better keep yourself in here. There's a side on view. And finally, stars in our universe have the unique, uh, rather rare property of being able to make both carbon and oxygen, which are two very useful things for life. 
as you know, being a carbon-based organism, breathing some oxygen right now. So if you want to do that, then you should stay in this little bit here. You should also remember that I told you that this is a logarithmic plot, so I've distorted the axes in order that you can see this. Okay? If you would like a version of this plot that doesn't do that, that just uses ordinary linear uh, uh, things, and you still want to see this area, you're going to need to expand the size of this uh, screen here until it's 10 light years tall. That is the image I want to leave you about fine tuning. We are there, right? There we are. We are in a universe that can do some pretty amazing things, surrounded by universes that can't do very much at all. There's something pretty interesting going on around here. We can do the same sort of thing with uh, the universe as a whole, those numbers that tell us how the universe is expanding. Keep an eye on the time. Um, oh, sorry, if you needed a blatantly obvious visual metaphor, there's a razor blade's edge for you. Does anyone need that? Good. OK, moving on. Um, our universe makes galaxies. You're in one, so it's done quite well. Here's how that happens. Here's a piece of the universe which we can simulate in a computer. Now, this piece would be expanding, but if I show you the expansion, most of the box will disappear out of the screen. So we're going to factor out that expansion and just show you what happens. We start with the universe is, is smooth in its earliest stages, and then we can get a computer to tell us, all right, the, the dense bit of the universe will attract a bit more matter. If uh, they get dense enough, then uh, they'll make stars. Uh, let me just show you the movie. This is uh, from the Eagle collaboration. Uh, this simulation took about a month and a half on a couple of thousand computers. If you try to do this on your laptop, it would take about 500 years, so don't. Um, what you see is that the dense bits of the universe get denser, they get bigger. Okay? So any bit of the universe which has more stuff gets even more stuff. So the rich get richer. Unfortunately, the universe is uh, not very democratic. Um, as the universe makes stars, uh, those stars feed back energy into the, the stuff around them. And so at the centers of these are where galaxies form. This scale is much bigger than any particular galaxy, but you can see where the knots are. You'll get stars forming, and as stars blow up in supernovae, that will feed back out into the universe. And so you get a very pretty looking movie. By the way, we're going up here at a rate of about uh, a billion years every two seconds. So this is one heck of a fast forward. Um, so that's what's going on. We discovered in 1998 that the expansion of the universe, the universe is not just getting bigger, the galaxy is not just moving away from us, it's accelerating. The galaxies are not just moving away, they're moving away faster today than they were yesterday. But what that tells us is probably there's a type of energy in the universe that we didn't know about beforehand. We didn't really have a good idea what to call it, so we call it dark energy. You can think of that as we're completely in the dark energy. Um, uh, we <laughs> That joke didn't even deserve that. I mean, but <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the pity laugh, but OK, good. Um, what we can do is say, all right, what if it were different? Again, we have an enormous range of possibilities for the amount of dark energy, especially if it's something called vacuum energy, which I won't go into. And what I've been doing is running the universe again with different amount. Ooh, that's, yep, OK. Can we get these lights off? That's not going to look particularly good. Anyone? OK. I've been running them again on not quite as big a supercomputer as everyone else, but you know, these aren't going to be quite as spectacular. Let me run that again. So um, here's a piece of the universe, and in this one there's no dark energy. And what we see is that it, we get that hierarchical structure forming. So there, there'll be two little galaxies that come together here. They collide with each other. What I can do is run it again. That's going to be the same one as before. And this one is going to be one where the... Why do the lights come back on? No, I'm not done. <laughs> There's plenty more of these. It's going to be fun. OK. This is, um, this is the one we just saw before. This is where you put 10 times more dark energy in than we have in our universe. The start looks the same, but after a certain amount of time, that dark energy is going to make the expansion of the universe start to accelerate, and then this one is now frozen while this one is still going on. It might be clearer if I pump things up to 100 times, and now that is totally frozen in. Because remember, I took out the expansion of the universe. Everything here is now, if we put that back in, is just too far away from everything else. Gravity has totally lost its grip on everything, and that coming together you need to make a galaxy is completely stalled. 
So uh, I can zoom in on a particular bit of the universe. So we'll see two galaxies here that collide, but over here, they sort of miss their appointment. They get carried away by the dark energy. And that opportunity to combine their gas resources to make more stars and more planets and all that sort of stuff is missed. I pump, bump things up by, a factor of ten, by another factor of 10, and not much happens over here at all. The structure of the universe just freezes, nothing else happens. So that was for dark energy 100 times more than what we see in our universe. The range of possibilities is 10 to the power of 120 times larger. It is, in fact, ridiculously easy on that scale to make a universe where the, the point at which structure stops forming is, instead of being after, say, a billion years in this one, is after about 20 seconds. And on that scale, nothing happens. It's really easy to make a universe in which nothing much happens at all. There's no structure. The most that happens is two lonely particles might hit each other, but then they're not coming back and they're not hitting anything else for another couple of billion years or trillion years or squillion years. So that, this is called the fine-tuning of the cosmological constant or, or of dark energy. This is another way to make a universe which completely fails to do anything interesting, and the vast majority of those will fail to do anything interesting. Let me move along quite quickly. Uh, if you want some more details about this, there are plenty more cases I've given you too. There's also the strengths of those forces. Those are fine-tuned. The number of spatial dimensions. If you have a three-dimensional universe with one dimension of time, we can mess with those and see what happens. Actually, three-dimensional universe is pretty interesting. So if you want some more details of that, you can look in the book that I wrote with Geraint Lewis. Now is the time to tell you something about Geraint. Geraint is an atheist. He's a friend of mine. Uh, but we wrote this book together because we agreed on the science. We wrote the first seven chapters of this book together, all about the science and what fine-tuning means, and we disagree. There's like one footnote where it, which starts, at this point, a disagreement broke out amongst our heroic authors. So look out for that one. <laughs> point being that actually there's not a lot of dis debate within the literature, within the scientific literature where this field started. There's not much debate about the, the basic facts I've been telling you. So this is something that, the cosmo that scientists, physicists will do with their models. If you've got a free parameter, you change it to see what happens. And we noticed that there were some disasters. What we disagree about, which is chapter 8 of the book, is what this means. So let me quickly run through what Geraint think it mean, thinks it means. And it might be true. I, you know, on, on my view, it might be true as well. Um, what he wants to talk about is something called the multiverse. Maybe you're very unlikely to get life, but there's lots of different chances out there. This thing called the multiverse has invaded comic books for some reason. Uh, Infinite Crisis, fight for the multiverse. I don't know why Batman is there. Because I'm not a character in the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> we are not all comic book nerds. Sorry, okay, let's, I can get, I'll get over that. Okay, here's the idea. We basically, we win the cosmic lottery. If something unlikely happened, well, maybe we had lots of different goes at it. In this case, the unlikely thing is the entire universe itself. So this theory is going to mean there's lots of other universes out there. Why should we believe that? Well, a hint, we get a hint from ideas about how our universe was in its earliest times, what's called inflationary cosmology. Uh, the idea is it would explain a lot of things about our universe if in its very earliest stages, its acceleration was exponential. If we can make that happen, it would explain something. And in a lot of those ideas, the kind of uh, different places in the universe get different laws can come out naturally. It's a bit of a stretch, but there are at least the kind of clues there we would like to see. The interesting thing about this idea is there is a way it could be wrong, which I like to call revenge of the Boltzmann brains. Um, if you thought this talk was weird so far, it's... Yeah, here we go. All right? This is a theory which posits the existence of a population of things. There are these other universes out there. So what you can do with that population of things is, in your model, in your idea, right, you can sort of mentally get your clipboard out and go around to all the different bits of the universe, and if you find someone, you say, what's your universe like? And then write it down, and then collate all your results. And then what you want to know is, Okay, if, that, if this idea is successful, our type of universe that we see around us should be, at least be kind of typical of the universes around there. And there's an interesting way in which we 
uh, in which an idea, a theory about the multiverse might fail this test. So our universe, in order to create us, according to the standard model, starts off in a very simple early state, as you saw in that simulation, makes galaxies, makes stars, makes planets, lets that planet go around a whole heap of times, and then ask a biologist, out comes life. I have no idea, but ask a biologist. Not my field. In a lot of these models, there's a worry, and the worry is that it would be easier to make life, more common way to make life would be to go back to the start and just have a brain pop out at the beginning with all of my memories in it. Now, this sounds like science fiction. The, the worry here is not that, oh, oh, I wonder if we're one of these random brains that just has all my uh, memories, but it hasn't actually experienced anything. Right? That's not the worry. The worry is that if your idea predicts something and gets it wrong, then your idea is probably wrong. And a lot of these multiverse models could predict, and I think a lot of them actually do predict, that actually the most likely way to make life is not the way we turned up, but this sort of random brain popping out of the middle of nowhere. That's called the Boltzmann brain problem. And we have reached the weirdest bit of cosmology. Thanks for following me there. I will now return to something which we're a bit more familiar with, being in church. Um, so the other option is maybe there's a fine tuner seems a pretty natural thing to think at this point. The universe we see around us seems like someone's thought it through. And the idea is, when we, get, when we look at the basic level of physics, we seem to be getting the same impression. So I like to imagine at this point some chess pieces on a chessboard trying to work out the rules of chess. They want to know what the laws are that are moving them around. This analogy is not perfect, but it'll do. Right? So they watch, and after a while they notice, hey, the, the bishop only ever moves diagonally, so they write that down as a sort of law of chess. If they keep watching long enough, they'll see that some of the other rules, like castling, they'll be more rare. But eventually, we could get to the point where the chess pieces could write down the actual rules of chess. Okay? Here's what I want you to imagine. Imagine we've got to the point in science where at some future meeting of the really important physicist society, uh, Alberta Einstein walks up to the blackboard and scribbles down some equations and physics is over. Fundamental physics is done. Right? Like the chess pieces working out how their world works, we sort of solved it. The universe would be like a solved crossword puzzle. Okay? Now, there'd be more physics to do, right? just as in there's more to chess than working out what the rules are, there's chess strategy about what, you know. So the, 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 in this analogy, there'd be more physics to do about how these laws play out. In terms of the laws, let's just imagine we've got them, okay? Now, you can just all stare at that chalkboard in your minds for a while. It's kind of a, if you're a physicist particularly, it's kind of a harrowing thought to just sort of stare at these other laws of the universe. There's nothing deeper, there's nothing else, that's it. The question to ask now is, are we done, explanation-wise? Would we be happy to stop there? Should everyone just you know, high-five and head for the pub and congratulations, everyone, we've solved physics? Or have you got more questions to ask? So if the chess pieces look at the rules of chess and ask each other, why aren't we playing checkers? They will not get the answer to that by looking harder at the rules of chess. You will need something else, something above. So if there is an explanation for why the laws of nature are the way they are, it's going to have to be something else. Or we just stop there and say, that's it, it's a brute fact. So what makes a good explanation? There's a huge question. Here's a very simplified analogy in terms of a board game. One of the things that makes a good question is that I think that it cuts down on a whole space of possibilities. So hopefully you know the game Guess Who, where the other person has one of these characters and uh, what you have to do is ask questions like, Does, do they have a beard? And then you knock down pieces to, get, to try and isolate who the other person is. Well, you've got a large set of possibilities. The really good questions are the ones that really knock down a lot of options, right? The classic being, do they have both a beard and a moustache? Because if you ask that question, you get, yes, it's Robert. It's Richard, sorry. Uh, that's a memory from childhood, obviously. Um, so where there are a whole heap of possibilities, a really good explanation will tell us, will be able to sort of nail down which one of those we think is the actual one. So let's think again about that chalkboard. Just stare at it again, like, uh, there's, there's Alberta, she's just finished, there's her chalkboard. 
Are there any other possible ways the universe could have been? Well, yeah. This is one of the reasons it's really hard to be a theoretical physicist. There's loads of ways the universe could have been. We can make up equations. That's the easy bit. The hard bit is actually working out which one is ours. We could take Alberta's board and just surround it by other chalkboards full of a whole heap of other equations. Every other mathematical way that's consistent is a way the universe could have been. I don't know if you've seen a mathematical library, they can get pretty big. Every other mathematical possibility is a way the universe could have been. Why that way? If you're a, what's called a philosophical materialist, if you think that natural stuff is the only stuff, then that board is sort of the end of all explanations. So if you have any more questions, they are in principle unanswerable. You're done. That's it. If you want to know why this universe rather than one of these other possible ones, you will not get an answer. There cannot be an answer on materialism. What I think fine-tuning shows is the way in which theism can win as an explanation. What we can do is we don't have the ultimate law of nature. We can take the best that we have and look at that section of here are the possible universes and ask whether knowing that theism is true, knowing that there is a good creator of the universe will help us in knocking off some of those possibilities. And if it does that, then it's got a real advantage. So if we take the section of those possible boards which have a cosmological constant, a dark, dark energy, and we say, and of, of which naturalism in and of itself can say, I have no idea which one of those is the actual one. It can't flip anything down. We say, okay, which one of those has the particular good thing of having creatures in it that can experience love? And hey presto, an awful lot of the possibilities go down. Something like 10 to the power of 90. By an enormous margin, if you knew about this universe that it made creatures that can, can do you know, morally significant actions, you have a huge clue about which universe is the actual one. If you look at the possibilities for the, the mass of the fundamental particles, naturalism doesn't know which one is which, but if you say, well, all right, which one of those will cre it could possibly create creatures which can do things like you know, love and play the piano and do good things that a good creator might want to create, then, hey, presto, a whole heap of those possibilities go down, and you know you understand something deeper about the universe. Faced with the actual way that the universe is, let's finish science off, let's give science all everything it possibly wants. If you've still got questions about why that universe rather than another one, the theist keeps on thinking. They don't stop there. And what fine-tuning shows is that there is a deeper, an deeper answer to that question that can really make a difference. You really understand something deep about the way the universe is if you realise how well it can explain why there are creatures in it like us. That is how I think that argument goes. Geraint disagrees. If you would like to know more about why Geraint disagrees, then you can read more about it in the book. But I'm sure we'll get some from a question. I think there's a deeper principle here about how we think about science. Um, I like to use the example of um, knowing the laws of nature, the ultimate laws of nature, would be a bit like knowing the characters and the plot and the beginning of a particular novel. You would know a lot about the internal nature of that novel. You know about why things happen. You could do all sorts of fan theories about how things particularly work. What you will not discover is why the book is there at all. And in particular, you can talk about Harry Potter all day, but you will not use Harry Potter to replace J.K. Rowling. You cannot replace the author with a character. We can do all the science we want, but you won't answer the deeper questions. Why is this universe? Why a universe at all? to which you must look for a deeper answer. Thank you very much.